Hey, welcome, welcome everybody back to another Thursday. It is April 1st, April Fool's Day. So we have a great guest for that for today. You are on with hurdlers of adversity, inspirers and maximizers of pivotal moments. So I want to caveat this just a little bit. We're having a little bit of a time delay right now, so it will be a little bit a uh, little funky, but we'll, we're going to get through it. It's going to be it's going to be an awesome show because I can't wait to talk to our guests today. Um, so welcome, welcome. I'm your host, John Register. I a, I'm a business owner of Inspired Communication International. And what we do is we help business professionals hurdle adversity, amputate fear, embrace a new normal mindset to win the medals in their life. So if you're on right now, I want to know where you are watching live from. So put that in the chat box so we can just honor and celebrate you. We always put you up on the screen. We want to know where you are watching this program from. Uh, So this is also uh, the beginning of Limb Loss Awareness Month. And that's for because I'm an amputee is really particular to me. And I was going to have a lot of great little videos and vignettes out this morning. But last night, about three o'clock in the morning, I started having severe phantom pains <laughs> i mean it was just killing me uh and and so and, and it's, it's been going on even till right now i'm not sure what happened but i think it was because i finished my fort carson swim and they had they had an event from january all the way to uh the end of march which was swim colorado springs about 30 miles so i did 30 miles worth of swimming and i was supposed to get my t-shirt last night and guess what at the end of that they didn't have enough t-shirts in my size what's up with that you're supposed to have that. You know I'm coming. I'm going to finish. But I finished my swim, and I swam like two two miles and a quarter yesterday. So I think that's got my my nerve uh, just kind of just going. But we got we are on April Fool's Day. So have you ever um, Googled yourself? And what did you come up with? <laughs> well, that's going to be my guest coming up today. I Googled myself and found some incredible John Registers that are out there. So we have me interviewing me and see what, what my life would have been like if I was another John Register. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, but before we get there, uh, please share this out with your tribes whenever you come in. So if you're watching the replay, share this out with your networks. Uh, because I think this is going to be an absolutely fun show. Uh, Follow me on LinkedIn, all the social media platforms that are out there. Uh, Subscribe on YouTube and and join our Facebook group, which is uh, Amputate Fear. So that's facebook.com slash group slash Amputate Fear. So I see we're getting more and more people on. So tell me where you are streaming in. Uh, where are you? Are you on YouTube? Are you on Facebook? Or are you in the um, in, in LinkedIn? LinkedIn didn't work last week for some reason. I don't know, but uh, but that's that's what we have right now. And I, I just see, I think we um, I'm looking right now because I think our guest just went away. So uh, I gotta gotta I'm not gonna not gotta do it tap dance <laughs> until he comes back and dials back in on the show. All right, uh, many of you are may not be familiar with me. And so kind of my hero's journey is I was uh, uh, a world-class athlete back in the day and had was also a combat army veteran. And during this time, uh, I wound up, you know, wanting to be a lifer in the military. So as I did all of that, uh, I wound up having a, a whole set path. I thought it was going to be a lifer, work work 20 years in the military, get out, work the same job I was in the military, and then come back and work as a, as a civilian. The second thing, um, hey, Lynn Keir out there in sunny but cold Charlotte. It's the same thing right here as well. Um, so the, the same thing with um, uh, in track and field. I was on my way to the Olympic Games. I was a three-time All-American and had been twice to Olympic trials and missed up the hurdle, dislocated my left knee, severed an artery behind the kneecap, and then seven days later became an amputee. Of course, we're talking about Limb Loss Awareness Month, and we have um, uh, John and Amy are back on, so I'm glad we have them back on the, on the screen again. And uh, so so that was kind of the whole process, this whole, this whole thing of what we were um, – trying to overcome. And my wife says to me, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. This is just our new normal. And so it was with a new normal mindset that I elevated and began to uh, run, uh, swim for physical therapy. And then I ran track uh, and won a silver medal in the long jump in Sydney, Australia. Then I built a military sport program to help wounded, ill and injured service members use sports as a tool for the rehabilitation. So I wanted to say really quickly, a hello to 
Lynn Keir from Charlotte. Thank you for being on, Lynn. I really appreciate you uh, all the time being there. So thanks, Lynn. Uh, so keep on inviting people into the show, into the the house where it is. So I guess you figured out how to put your name on the uh, on the on the on the Facebook. So thanks for for doing that and and always being on, Lynn. Um, so that's kind of my life and who I am, just in case anybody is trying to figure it out and, and follow me for the first time or you're looking at this from the live stream for the first time. So I'll let you give you a little bit of background on myself. So let's meet our guests for today. Uh, this is absolutely going to be fantastic, a fantastic show. Um, because, like I said earlier, have you ever sat down and just Googled yourself, right? As an adjective, Google yourself. So when I started Googling myself, <laughs> I came up with a person uh, that the, the first person I saw was, OK, who's who's out there? Who's who's in my my lane, my neck of the woods? And so I started putting put the, the name John Register in. And the first person that came up was a John Register who's a painter. And and I was I was ranked below this guy in my in the Google search. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And I looked deeper into it and found out that he had passed away. <laughs> So I had a, a dead John Register outranking me in Google, and I think he still does. <laughs> He's doing great. <laughs> Keep going, John. Uh, so that was awesome. Um, but then I started, you know, I, saw, I thought that was pretty cool. So I started doing more oh research gosh. and Googling out for more John Registers, and I came across one who was working for this company I found to be absolutely fascinating and we struck up a nice friendship. And so I have him on the show. So as April Fools, I'm going to interview myself as John Register, as another John Register, and we're gonna have this conversation. He's got his <laughs> wife, Amy, with him as well. It's gonna be a fantastic ride for us today. So she is the executive director of the CDH Foundation located in Auburn, Alabama, but serving families uh, nationwide. Her 20 plus years of experience in consulting and corporate marketing, she took that experience to help launch the Sensor Green CDH Foundation in 2017. And she's gonna tell us all about uh, CDH and what that what that might be. So my wife, Alice, her name is Amy. Uh, so A and A, so that's pretty another pretty, pretty cool thing. Uh, what what might have my wife, Alice, been doing as an Amy? So that's pretty cool. Uh, and, then, and then he is <laughs> a sales and marketing professional. I am. Uh, he has a diverse background in the consumer packaged goods, CPG, and electronics and aerospace industry spanning more than three decades. He holds a Bachelor's of Business Administration from uh, the University of Georgia in Finance and Master's of Science degree from Georgia State University in Marketing. So please welcome to Life's New Normal uh, and the, the Hurdles of Adversity Inspirers, Conversation with Inspirers and Maximizers of Pivotal Moments. John and Amy Register. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you guys? It's wonderful to meet both of you through the uh, through StreamYard. I'm doing absolutely fantastic, and I know we have just a little bit of a delay here, so I will pause and wait for your response, uh, and then I'll and then you do the same for me, so I can uh, so we can have a better conversation with the uh, the Wi-Fi. But it's 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 uh but but I'm so excited that you are both on the show. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. One hundred percent. Okay, so John, first question is for you. Um, so I, I Google myself, and I came up with the painter, and then I, I came up with with you. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just put typed in the the, the search box on LinkedIn or anything, and just to try to find another one of you in in the world? Actually, I have. And I'd had the same routine or two. <laughs> and I found that, you know, I kind of read about him. He's famous and all that. And he was deceased. So I was kind of the same reaction. I'm like, I'm not very high up on the search engine optimization. So I didn't expect to be. But uh, and then I actually that's how I found you a number of years ago was through that. Search. I read about you thought that uh, you seem like a really cool guy with Corey. And I, I checked out your website and really had a lot of uh, it really spoke to me about what your mission seems to be, which is, you know, getting a positive message out there and talking to people how, how to overcome adversity. So that's when I wanted to come on LinkedIn. So I think that's been probably maybe six years ago, maybe longer. And uh, so, yeah, I did the same thing, John, and I kind of had the same reaction initially, but I'm glad I did because that's together. So. 
I think that's absolutely fantastic. Amy, when you heard that your husband had found another John Register that he's communicating with on LinkedIn, what was your reaction? It was kind of like, oh, Lord, there's another one. Uh, <laughs> no, not really. I thought it was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the way that you guys found each other, I thought it was super interesting. You're kind of both from the same towns in South Georgia originally. I found that absolutely fascinating. So the, the, the question kind of one of, one of the things, questions I had before we kind of get into some of the more serious issues is, is okay, uh, it's Sunday dinner. What's mom cooking for dinner? What's, what's the, what, or what's dad cooking for dinner? What's the, what's the, what's the registered dish? that is on Sunday dinner that I, I would be eating? We grill a lot on Sundays, yeah. usually steak. Yeah, maybe a London broil or some steaks. A chicken, I'm, I'm a beef eater. I want it browned on each side and kind of still mooing. So <laughs> on um, on Sundays, yeah, usually steaks. Yep, I agree. <laughs> and, and what and what about in your households as you grew up? What what will be cooking then? Um, my parents were always adventurous eaters, and my dad was a field sales rep in Alabama when I was little. So he would come home from the coast with a bushel of oysters and fresh shrimp, and we would have um you know, shrimp boils and fish fries and all that kind of stuff on Friday nights. Or um, a lot of times we went, there was a Mexican restaurant in Montgomery, Alabama that we would go to as a family, um, which it was seventies. And so we were on a bench seat with me in the middle, no um, seat belt. My mom in the passenger seat with my brother on her lap going off <laughs> Montgomery on the interstate. Um Awesome. How about, how about you, John? That's great. Yeah, I would say probably uh, a lot of times it would be, you know, Southern favorites, fried chicken, uh, maybe some uh, pot roast, something like that. I mean, we, we would typically, my mom cooked a lot. She was a stay at home mom and we had a lot of home cooked meals. Um, and that would typically be kind of the type of thing we would have. Well, we had a lot of pot roast as well with nice, great potatoes because I grew up on the west side of Chicago. And uh, but the only thing about Chicago, it's in it's in an onion field. It used to be an onion field, <laughs> and so we have a outside of Chicago. There's a lot of there's a lot of greenery, <laughs> and so we have a lot of farmland, a lot of um, corn, corn, and everything. In fact, one of my uh, buddies, he's he's like number two on the on the Mercantile Exchange, the CME Group, and every time I ask Charlie. Um, uh, and I, when I see him, I'm always asking him, hey, 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 Charlie, how's corn? How's corn today? Are we going up? Are we going up in corn today? And so uh, it's, that's just the, the big Chicago thing that we always have uh, for the um, for the stock market. So we're always eating corn and, and potatoes and everything like that for the, the futures on that. So uh, the, the question I have is, you know, in, in the you know, we talk about adversity and, you know, all we've all kind of been through this this time this year. What is the most challenging adversity? that you've had to over overcome in your professional careers? Do you want to tackle that first? Yeah, I think um, I'll go uh, John, then Amy, yeah, or Amy, yeah. John, doesn't matter. I, it's funny, I was actually um, in a Bible study yesterday and we talked some about this. Um, the minister that was leading this is a, a, a friend, classmate from my, long ago days and she has a phd she's been a methodist minister for years and years and years and um we've been doing this book on reconciliation and um i don't know how it evolved into a conversation about the same sort of topic but i said yesterday that the most surprising thing that i found especially having the parents that i had who had a son or and treated me as as our sex grant did the dishes and I helped with, you know, take out the trash. There weren't boy girls and uh, or boy jobs and girl jobs. There were just jobs. Um, the biggest shock to me is the amount of sexism that women still face in the workplace. And it has been time to overcome. Wow. Um, and how have you 
and your work, how, how have you dealt with that and kind of seeing it? Yeah. Um, you know, the things that I would always do is just try to be the most prepared person in the room. And sometimes people were going to listen to me and sometimes people were going to turn to my male counterpart that had gray hair and, um, you know, was a man. Um, but trying to always be prepared, trying to outwork folks. And, you know, in the position that I am in now, it's interesting because I wrote to a board and um, I think 90 percent of our board is female. So, you know, now we're all kind of a group of women of a similar age and we've all experienced that to some extent. And so um, we understand what that is and we actively look for male perspective when we're making decisions so that, you know, we're not just representing the moms that we serve, but that we also have something for the dads as well. Well, I should have had you on last month because that was our, our celebration of, of, of the ladies. And uh, we had some phenomenal ones on that. I'm, I'm in that mode still of asking the, that those type of questions. Uh, because I think there, it's it's really fascinating to see. Okay, yes, you are the most prepared that comes into the room. How do you deal with being overlooked, in and you know that you have the um, the wherewithal and the smarts, and and uh, and that question does go to that gray gray bearded guy that's over there um, instead of instead of going to you who has the actual answer. Well, I think. The interesting thing, especially now being a working mom, is I think that women drive their careers in a very different way than men do now because of sexism in the workplace and because, you know, there there's a meme that floats around that I see every so often that says, you know, moms have to work like they don't have children and they have to raise kids like they don't work. And so I think that, you know, the the idiom is necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that that goes out to a lot of working mom jobs, especially those of us that um, are able to either because our husbands make a certain amount of money or because of where we live or grandparents being nearby. I think a lot of us and a lot of the, the people that I've ended up being friends with that are working moms, we've figured out ways to freelance and find project work so that we can balance that out. And where I am now, I sort of fell into freelance and project that came out of having two small children, a husband that traveled and wanting to keep my toes in the water of the work world. So John, you have, um, now you're at home because COVID had hit and kind of everything shut the world down. So now you're probably not traveling as often as you did. How has it been for you? How, how, how did you shift and pivot uh, kind of in the sales industry uh, to either s support or you did, to, to, to be more aware of what was going on in the household? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a loaded question. I, uh, I'll have to see how to answer that. <laughs> But it's a good question, John. I think for us, I I try, I, I, I want to help more and that Amy's not overwhelmed. Which I am most days. And I, I, I know that she's overwhelmed because being a mom is a 24 hour, you know, 360 years as a dad, but not to the level a mom is. Um, and I know that she uh, has a demanding job and on both the professional front and the home front. Um, and so I think it's still a challenge though to, to do as much as you really need to do and you wanna do. I mean, I, I find myself sometimes I have five or six conference calls in a day and I'm in the basement. I, I usually try to work in the basement. The kids are on the first level doing virtual school, which they've been doing for over a year now. And then Amy is trying to live and get our work done. Um, so I, I guess the answer to that question is, John, um, it's really been tough for us. And I know it's got to be that way for a lot of other people because, um, you know, it, it's no matter how you slice and dice it, 
I think the mom ends up a lot of times doing the lion's share of things. And it's not in our situation. It's not because I want her to do that. It's just how it ends up happening. Well, and I think society is part of that as well, because, you Mm -hmm. know, teachers aren't going to email him when little Johnny hasn't turned in his assignment. I get the email. Mm -hmm. So and that's fine because I'm usually the default parent because he's usually in Canada or on the West Coast or wherever. So I I get that. But, um, you know, it it has been an interesting balance. It's very interesting um, about what a before the pandemic, we moved to a much bigger house and we have family therapists and child psychologists that live across the street from us. I think God just put us in the right place to handle this whole thing. Yeah, that was a blessing. But um, Y'all yeah. won on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I, I don't think we're a whole lot different than any other couple doing this is that, you know, John tries to say, okay, what can I take off your plate? And I give him stuff that he can off my plate, but, you know, know, get sent from school or stuff like that. It goes to me first and I then have to delve it out. And, um, you know, he wants to do a lot. And fortunately he's been able to do, some drop offs for testing and, you know, run to extracurricular stuff and all that kind of stuff while we've been doing the silver lining in this, John, if there is one, it's hard to find a silver lining in a pandemic. Right. But Amy and I were talking the silver lining is that we've had more time as a family. Um, the kids have been doing virtual school since spring break of last year. So um, I haven't traveled on a business trip since March of last year. So we've been had more together time. We've we've uh, whereas normally we would have been spread out. Yeah. So that's we've probably, enjoyed that. I mean, I think we have really enjoyed it. You know, yeah. there have been a few days where I'm like, I got to go somewhere. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the funniest thing was well, not funny. Our son got really, really sick Christmas of 2019 and was in the hospital for a couple of weeks into the first part of 2020. And I remember telling friends, you know, that we're bringing food to the hospital and all that kind of stuff. And I know he's doing very well. Um, I said, I am so angry that we have been separated over this Christmas break because our younger son went to my parents' house, had a hip replacement. She couldn't navigate our stairs. And my dad was coming in and staying at the hospital some with our son because I got sick because I'd been up all night for four or five nights. And he and I were just passing shifts in the night. We saw each other as we switched off the hospital shifts. Um, But when he got home, I was like, I am so angry that this time that we're never going to get back has been stolen from us. And this whole Christmas vacation was ruined. And, you know, we went to Disney for spring break um, as our reward for getting through it and all that kind of stuff. The last day that we were at Disney World, that's when Disney World announced that they were shutting down and we got home and school was canceled for at least two weeks. And it was kind of like, yeah, you don't get too angry. Um, you know, God might humble you <laughs> so and give you a whole year together. <laughs> I think a lot of families found that out and um, and I won't get into all the all the things that that have happened with, you know, from individuals who lost loved ones right during this time. And those those that, you know, I almost lost my my wife during this time. She w- got really sick with with COVID. Um, and it's it's it's, um you know, even now she's not back to 100 percent when they've done the lung X-rays uh, and trying to balance that with those that are, you know, pro mask wears or negative mask wears and trying to, you know, trying to get people to understand your position. And, and I think that helped us increase a skill set of, you know, um, of kind of truth telling in our own truths and, and kind of, you know, fact check instead of just being out there and taking what somebody else has said. Have you found that, John, um, like when you're now, because you're in the airline kind of business, uh, and that's just kind of was decimated during that time. How were you able to pivot and amongst all those things and regulations and 
and protocols that were being inter interjected into the industry during this time. And, and, you know, and then people were just not flying. I mean, uh, they're still trying to come back, but they're, they're still not out there in, in mass. Well, that's a great question, John. And the answer is it's been very difficult. Um, my role is I'm a, I'm an aerospace sales manager. Um, and I sell to airlines and aircraft manufacturers uh, in Canada and the Western U.S. And uh, in Canada, they're still heavily hit. Um, the air traffic there is still way, way down compared to pre-COVID levels. In the U.S., it's starting to come back uh, more so than in Canada. So, um, you know, what we've done, I mean, the industries are smaller now because a lot of people there have been a lot of people that lost jobs, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people that have been furloughed, uh, you know, some permanently. So I think what what I'm doing and what uh, people that I know in the industry are doing, we're trying to really focus on helping the customers get ready for when they do things do recover, make sure that their their fleets are ready to go. And they're and they're and we think that people are going to start traveling. Leisure travel is going to pick up first. Vacation travel, hopefully this summer. The key is vaccinations, right? Hopefully everyone will get vaccinated. We can hit herd immunity at 70% or so. And the belief is that'll start people traveling for vacations and this travel will, tra will happen later sometime. But the, the leisure travel market is gonna be what comes back first. Mm -hmm. So it's still difficult, but you're dealing with a lot of, uh, the reality is across airlines and uh, you know, manufacturing companies like like me that's a supplier to airlines and to supply aircraft manufacturers it, the organizations are smaller uh, because of these being so impacted wow. wow yeah we don't think about the the impacts that kind of always go down and and hit various levels of others you know smaller suppliers that are out there you know trying to live and trying to keep their employees going you know the mid-cap businesses small small businesses that are out there um and they get hit and decimated just as, as well uh we've been talking a lot about you know not shopping at the major stores or ordering online anymore but really trying to support those those mom and pops that are out there um uh, and you know ordering from them or going into their restaurants uh so that we can keep that economy uh, generating uh, revenue. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with John and Amy Register. Can you believe that? I'm talking to a John Register, and uh, and we've been having a fantastic conversation, kind of talking around around COVID and and how the shift and pivot is. If you've been enjoying the conversation and you want to uh, just shout them out, please put them in the chat and and share them with your networks wherever you're listening uh, on this show and this program today. And we want to see your your notes in the post to comment box on LinkedIn or wherever you're watching from on on Facebook or in uh, on YouTube. Um, so let's kind of shift a little bit. Um, you know, and in, in, in prior to uh, your your position that you have right now, I want to know a little bit more about uh, this, what you've been doing, Amy, with this, this nonprofit. I think that's pretty fascinating. And if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing what that nonprofit is and how you got involved, I would, we'd love to just kind of learn a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Well, today's the perfect day because April is CDH Awareness Month and CDH stands for congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And that is when a child's diaphragm does not develop, develops partially or gets a hole in it um, in utero. Generally, it can happen after birth. Most of the families that we serve, this occurs in utero and it is identified at the 20 week anatomy scan. And mm -hmm. what happens when that occurs in utero is you have digestive organs that should be below the diaphragm, move up into the chest cavity. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it restricts lung growth. So the hernia in and of itself can be repaired. It is the damage that it does while a child is developing both digestively and in the respiratory tract that causes the life-threatening um, situation that um, our, our kids face when they're born and their, their families face and work and deal with really until a child is probably about four or five years old. At that point, 
Um, they're certainly not safe, but they're in a much more typically, um, you know, kid-like situation. They can generally go to school. They can generally um, run, dance, um, do all the little kid things that they should. But, but that comes with a lot of therapies, a lot of doctor visits and some scary times um, you know, because right now we're dealing with COVID. For these families, just a general cold, flu or RSV can land a child in the hospital and RSV or the flu can actually kill our children, um, our CDH babies and children. Yeah. Um, you know, so I serve on the board of directors for the American Association for People with Disabilities. So I've, I've seen uh, cases uh, like this. What are, when you look at the longevity and we talk about, you know, Ted, our, our board chair, Ted Kennedy Jr. talks a lot about um, that access from the ADA and uh, ADA 30. We've been 30 years since the American with Disabilities Act was formulated by George H.W. Bush. Um, however, you know, we haven't ma made that many roads into like employment. Uh, and he, he believes that's the next the next frontier of the ADA. How do mm -hmm. these uh, youth, when they grow up, what's their what's their uh, earning capacity? That I don't have a clear answer on. Most of the families that I work with have very small children. The thing and, and this is from me, not a medical professional, somebody that knows a lot about CDH, but I am not medical. The thing that we that you have to understand is this is generally identified through ultrasound um, technology that is part of prenatal care at what is called the 20 week anatomy scan. And sometimes they're done as early as 16, 18 weeks and sometimes as late as 21, 22 weeks. But mm -hmm. it's somewhere in that time frame, there's an anatomy scan where an ultrasonographer does what you see on TV or what, you know, anyone's wife or partner may have done, um, you know, if they're expecting a child and they look at brain development, all the major organs, all that kind of stuff to make sure that everything is developing appropriately. Um, that has been a part of prenatal care, general prenatal care, not high risk or anything like that since probably about 1980. So um, I was born in 74. My brother was born in 77. My mom had the best prenatal care that was available at the time. And she said when my brother was born in 77, that ultrasound was around, but really on, the only women that were having that done had some sort of big high risk or there was a problem that they were trying to identify. Mm -hmm. It wasn't routine. So we really only have about 40 years of children having this birth anomaly. I don't like calling it a birth defect because children are not defective. They have a difference. It's not a defect. Um, for 40 ish years, 35, you know, into small rural communities. So earning potential is something that I think we will understand better over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, we still have about a 50% mortality rate. Um, and of the ones, of these children who survive, many of them go on to lead very full and very fulfilling lives. And there are hospitals and children's hospitals and surgeons that have much better outcomes even than that 50% on up into the 90% survival rates. So I have been in contact through Facebook and some other groups with um, grownups as old as 50, 55 that survived um, CDH at birth, but they're very, very few and far between at this wow. point. Wow. Um, so right now we're looking at getting kids. I, I see a lot of 15, 16, 18, 19 olds that are beginning to go into college. Um, as you know, kind of a big group on these forums that I'm a part of, but um, earning potential right now and that type of long term career path thing that's going to be one of the things we really developing for the only 10 to 15 years. I, I see that's a long um, answer. I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's great. And <laughs> we have time <laughs> on the show, so <laughs> um. <laughs> 
Uh, John, I know we talked earlier. You said you were extremely proud of what Amy does on on this uh, on CDH, and I wanted you to share a little bit about you know what you see and how you've seen the growth and and her passion just kind of explode and how you support her uh, as as her husband. Well, John, I think I've I've seen a lot of. Um, first of all, I've seen a lot of families that are in a lot of pain. And I've seen, um, you know, I've, I've seen kind of the stress that it can cause and, and the, um, you know, I've just, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet some of these families and it really takes it from being kind of a concept and that's reality. Yeah. And, and you see what kind of havoc this disease can wreak on people from their just their ability to cope, their financial uh, uh, solvency, and ability to support themselves, just all and and, and just their general happiness in life. Um, and um, so I've been very touched by that, and I'm just very proud of Amy for kind of making this her mission to help people. You know, I mean, I. I like what I do in a career, but I, and I am, I feel like I am helping aircrafts be in the air and to take people where they want to go and need to go. And from that standpoint, okay, that's, I feel like I'm contributing something, but I'm not doing anything close to what Amy does with her job because she's helping people deal with lightning, a life threatening disease and giving them hope and connecting them with medical resources and financial resources to help them get through it, hopefully, um, as it's possible for those children to, 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 to live. And I think that's something that is really, um, that's, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really tangible and it, it makes a difference. And so I would say that's really kind of, um, what I've seen in the time, I guess you've been doing this now for four or five years. Wow. Four. Uh, so, well, uh, it's it's admirable, and you know, and we need, I think, more in the in the field to do it. A, a lot of people I'm t beginning to talk with now that are coming up on the end of, you know, career. They're thinking about their their transition and, and and what their what their legacy is that they want to you know leave behind uh, in their in their world. So a lot of more folks are transitioning into, you know, doing some some work that is impactful for. For them, I know I try to do the, the same thing, um, and I want to I want to I want to showcase uh, uh, Lynn right now because um, she she just put a comment up there and says so fun hearing from two John registers and Amy registers. So she she says uh, a great hello from uh, from North Carolina on that. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift gears one more time, and we're going to go into a flash round, and it'll be a little tricky because of the uh, of the uh, of the delay. But I want to ask you questions and. It's just, it's the first thing that comes to your mind uh, after I ask the question. Amy, you will answer first, <laughs> followed by John, so I can get two answers in one. So you'll answer first, Amy, then John will answer, and then I'll move on to the next question. Just rapid fire, first thing that comes to your mind, all right? JR's inspired, it's going to be six, probably six questions. Okay. Brave. <laughs> so here we go, here we go. Uh, <laughs> red or white wine? White. Red. On the speed limit or three miles over? Three miles over. Three miles over. Favorite soup? Chicken and rice. Uh, some kind of seafood soup. Gumbo. Uh, the quote or mantra you say the most? There you go, gumbo. <laughs> Say that again. The quote or mantra you mantra say the most. Um, follow directions, make choices. <laughs> I'm a mom. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you know, I'm trying to remember what I say the most. Um, can you help me with that? Amy probably know. knows. <laughs> I mean, like. <laughs> I'm trying to think of one that you say a lot. 
He's really good with dads or bad. I tell or, a lot of bad uh, jokes that are not funny that our kids, <laughs> our kids call them jokes. Um, you know, I, you know, I pass on that one. I, I would say the golden rule, treat people as you want to be treated because I'm always telling the kids not to hurt each other. And, <laughs> you know, so maybe that falls under that. <laughs> All right. And I tell them if they're going to hurt each other, outside because I blood on the carpet. So <laughs> right. no, no blood on the carpet. Uh, and, and no Kool-Aid either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the place you both love to visit. Grand hotel. In Utah? Yeah, I would say that it's a hotel on the coast of Alabama on the South coast. Oh, no. Love that. And Top three songs, last one, top three songs on your playlist. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to embarrass my husband. Um, Uptown Funk, um, Tina Turner's Proud Mary, and Bon Jovi, Born to Be My Baby. Love it. I'm going to have to go with, um, are we starting with like rating them third to the number one or does it matter? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just going to throw, throw it out there. Uh, Pride in the name of love, you two. Um, probably Michael Jackson beat it. Believing. That's the one you. Oh, and Journey, don't stop believing. Yeah, there you that's go. That's the one you sing in the house all the time. <laughs> yeah, very badly too. <laughs> yeah. He sings better than that's I do. The, that's so. the shower song. That's no my next one. Here. <laughs> What's the shower song? That's right. <laughs> Journey, don't stop believing. <laughs> all right. Um, that's great. Uh, okay, so now you can ask me five questions. Uh, and, and I will do my best to answer them. So you can, you can take your turn on, um, one each, or you can just, just fire them off together. If you, if you so desire. I'll go for it. Okay. Why don't you start up? Um, favorite city in the United States to visit. Chicago, Chicago. Favorite city in the world to visit. Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be your last meal if you could choose it? Ooh, last meal. Mm. I think bibimbap. It's a Korean dish. Ooh, yes, yes. Um. If you had a theme song for your life, what would it be? That's good. I like that. Hmm. A theme song for my life. <laughs> uh, probably <laughs> Peter Gunn. <laughs> 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 I like that. Um, and fifth and final one. Um, if you could do something career-wise that's not this, anything in the world, what would it be? Fly airplanes. Whether you have the talent to do it. Hmm? Fly airplanes. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. I'll see if I can hook you up, John. I'm I'm 100 fly <laughs> airplanes is what I would I would be doing. I would want to do that. I wanted to actually go into the Air Force. Well, our kids and I wanted to go into the Air Force, and um, I, I wound up um, going to the Army because of red green color blindness. <laughs> and then they sent me into a, a, a specialty that I had to uh, have multiple channel radios. So I had to, so I was qualified. And not qualify at the same time. So the army took me, and then the air force didn't. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, this has been outstanding, really fun. 
Um, any other thing that you would like to just to share to that that I may not have covered? No, I, I think so. I, I think that um, you know, I, I again, I got a ton of respect for you, John. I think you do great work, and the world needs more people that are building people up. Absolutely, and uh, being positive, creating positive energy. So please keep the positive energy coming and helping people stay motivated and pointed in the right direction. Uh, you be all, that beacon of light that you are. Well, I, I appreciate that. You all do the same. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored that you said yes to come on today. And uh, I've, I've just really enjoyed this conversation with both uh, you, John, and, and Amy. So thank you so much for this heartwarming conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Take care. We're going to get ready to get ready to close the show out. You can stay on if you want to. But I'm going to close it out, and uh, or you can just jump off. Um, so we have been talking with everybody, John and Amy Register. Can you believe that? I was talking to another John Register today because it's April Fools, and I wanted to April fool you all. Uh, so there was it was awesome just doing that. Lynn <laughs> has said it was so fun hearing from the two John Registers and Amy Register as well. And I wish I would have had Alice on, but she's actually with our daughter up in the uh, UNC Greeley, where our daughter has a new job. And now they've they just said she can come back to work. So the world's opening back up people. And I'm, I'm sad because she's been with us for an entire year. And I love her being there and having all these great shows that we can all do together. Uh, we asked the questions and we had a great time with the, the Fab, the, the, the JR's uh, Fab Five. Um, and so remember, you know, as we are going through this process that we have this time where we need to be kind of saying truth and, and truth, I don't believe is a what truth is actually a who. So if you want to know more about that, text me and I'll, and I'll and you can figure that out. So when truth outweighs fear, we commit to a courageous life. So what does that mean to each one of you? When truth outweighs fear, we commit to a courageous life. Making the jump is the jump. And Anais Nin said, that um, she says one of the, the most things that and, the, and she says, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than a, the risk it took to blossom. So each one of you can blossom out there. Just take the risk to do it. We talk about that all the time uh, in the presentations. Um, and remember that you are the inspirations. Inspirations lead us to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions then lead us to transformation results. And these results, they re-inspire us or they allow someone else that's watching the process to catch the vision. So therefore, you can go forth and inspire your world. Why? Because go is your command. Forth is your direction. Inspire is your vocation. Your, because it's only your work, only you can do it. And world, it's your sphere of influence. My name is John Register, the original John Register. <laughs> and each one of you have a wonderful day and uh, go forth and inspire your world. We'll talk to you next week on Hurdlers of Adversity, Inspirers and Maximizers of Pivotal Moments. Bye for now.